Good morning, Northeast. Welcome. We are glad to have you here today. Whenever you are watching, if you're in the watch party right now, feel free to drop a hey in the chat from you and your family on the side so that we know that you're here. There are two things I'm gonna talk about this morning. The first one is groups. As followers of Jesus, we are called more and more each day to reflect the nature of Christ. And there are many things that contribute to our growth as disciples, but I'll mention three. Um, spending time in God's word, spending time in prayer, and spending time in intentional community. If you feel like you need more of one of those or all three of those in your life, the best way to do this is to join a group. Our Northeast groups are open and they are going to encourage you in all three of those things in your life and they're gonna help you grow in your discipleship. So to sign up um, or just to learn more, you can visit northeastcc.com. The second thing is you're about to hear from one of our partners and one of my dear friends, Morgan Hume. I just saw on Facebook that our team, which I was on last year, was just down there a year ago. And while it's a bummer that we couldn't have gone in person this year, there are still ways that we can partner with them um, and bless our partners down in the DR. And you're gonna hear a little bit about that this morning. Hi, I'm Melissa McCormick. I work with Malachi Brick and Brian Drop on the Northeast Mission Committee. And today we are really excited to launch a new fundraising event to support one of our missionaries down in the Dominican Republic, Morgan Hume. Many of you know Morgan, and she's in the need of a car, a reliable, safe car. July is typically the month where we gather 15, 20 folks and we head on down to the DR. We offer our time and our talents and our prayers to two communities in particular, Los Guandules and Monterrey. This year, we had to cancel that trip, unfortunately, but that doesn't mean that we can't help and continue to support our missionaries, Morgan being one of them. So today we are launching this, this fundraising event to raise $10,000 for Morgan to purchase a safe and reliable vehicle. But before I get into the details on how you can donate, let's hear from Morgan on how a, a vehicle will provide her um, with a means to meet her goals and her mission. Hey Northeast, this is Morgan Hume. I'm a missionary in the Dominican Republic with Go Ministries, specifically with Go Sports. On a daily basis, outside of COVID-19, we get to work with over 600 kids in sports practices, English classes, Bible classes, and I personally get to interact with some of these kids and also with our Dominican coaches and teachers and help empower them to disciple these kids from ages seven to 21 years old in our college prep program. You know, being from the state, something that seems so simple to us, like uh, growing up playing sports and English classes, and Bible classes, those kinds of things seem so simple to us, but they're uh, opportunities that are hard to come by in this country. So it's just amazing to get to offer those resources and opportunities to these kids, but also to be a part of a staff that is so passionate about discipling and teaching the word, teaching about Jesus, making sure these kids understand the gospel. I've been living and working here for the last two years. I absolutely love it. I love what I do. As I've been thinking about and gearing up for what long-term missions will mean for me, I am becoming increasingly more aware of my need for one last big thing, and that is a reliable vehicle. Me and some friends on staff have put together some clips to kind of give you an idea. It's hard to describe and it's hard to imagine if you haven't been here, if you haven't been here in a while. The roads here are pretty rough and cars tend to break down faster and more frequently. I'm thankful that last year I was able to get this blue car that you're seeing on the screen from some other missionaries. And I've used it for a year. It's done what I needed to do but it's running into problems now and it's starting to break down more frequently and it's time that I invest in a reliable vehicle. As missionaries here, we're having to drive around all the time. Most of us live in the city in Santiago, but Go Sports, where we do all of our activities, happens in a town called Tamboril, which is about 15 to 20 minutes drive from where I live in Santiago. There are also many times when I need to drive outside of the city for other reasons, to visit other communities. 
Having a reliable vehicle really opens you up to a lot more opportunities in your own personal ministry because it opens up your schedule, more flexible to just drive wherever you need to go when you need to be there. And it also decreases the chance of my car breaking down and me getting stuck on the side of the road, which has happened a couple of times. It's just not a good situation to be in. And me as a young um, woman, I'm often traveling around by myself and driving around by myself. It's a lot safer if I have a reliable vehicle where I don't need to worry that it's gonna break down on the side of the road sometimes. <laughs> I have part of the money saved up already for this vehicle, but I will need help in fundraising for the vehicle, specifically $10,000 more that I will need to fundraise outside of my normal funds. So that's my goal, $10,000 to be able to complete my funds, to purchase a reliable vehicle. That would make a huge difference in my world down here. Thank you for allowing me to share this need with you. I miss my home church. Dearly. I love joining in on the YouTube live streams on Sunday mornings. It makes me feel so close to home. I'm praying for you guys all the time. If you would like to contact me or if you have any questions about anything at all, please feel free to email me and I'll talk to you later. Thanks, Morgan. Really appreciate an understanding of the situation that, um, that you're faced with down there as you try to continue your good work in the Dominican. So here's what we're asking. Share this message, contact your network, your family, your friends, all of those folks that you would have asked to donate to your trip expenses, ask them to donate to this one-time fundraising event to raise $10,000 for Morgan and a vehicle. You want, we have two ways to do that. You can either do that by online. You can go to northeastcc.com, click the give button, you will see a one-time special donation button, click on that, and it will bring up a financial page where you put your credit card information. In the general drop-down list, it will show Morgan Hume's name. That makes sure that we get our funds to the right account. If you don't want to, uh, to donate online, it is not a problem. Send a check, make it payable to Northeast Christian Church. Send it to 5651. East Riverside Boulevard, Rockford, Illinois, 61114. Either way, online check, not a problem. If you are sending a check, please put Morgan Hume in the memo line. That way we, again, make sure that we get the right funds to the right account. Please remember, all these donations are tax deductible. That is an added benefit and bonus to, uh, to, to donating to this special cause. You know, it's not out of the ordinary for us to provide vehicles to our missionaries. We have in the past provided vehicles for Rafaelito, for Kennedy, and for Lucenaire. This is just something that we do, and I'm pretty proud of being part of an organization that supports their partners and missionaries in this manner. So in summary, super quick, $10,000, donate online or by check, and share, 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 share on Facebook, share on all of your social media platforms. Let's raise $10,000 for Morgan. Let's get her a safe, reliable vehicle so she can continue to do the good work that she does. Thanks so much and have a great day. Thanks Melissa and Morgan for the update and the ask to give to this one-time special offering. We appreciate your dedication to the people and the DR and we look forward to seeing how God continues to bless you and bless our partnership with you. To give to that special offering, you can find that online. And while you're there, you can also send in your regular giving or even set up an automated giving. Now we're gonna move into our time of worship. So take it away, Abby and Malachi. To every battle, to every heartbreak, to every circumstance, I believe that you are my fortress. Let's
here today Mercies that are new All my fears and doubts Can all come to Because they can't stay alone And I'm here with you And it's a new horizon And I'm set on
what a year 2020 has been so far between the global pandemic, civil rights movement, the murder hornets that were announced, and then I don't know what happened to them. If you do, let me know. I'm very curious about them. But all in all, um, I think it's fair to say we're all a little bit overwhelmed with the learning and the unlearning that's been going on, and it's only July. One way that I cope with stress, if you can't already tell, is by buying plants. There's something um, special about plants, and if you're not someone who gardens or has plants, this won't mean anything to you, but if you are, like, you'll understand that like, making sure they have the best light, all of them take different kinds of watering, and the fertilizer that they're in, and you have to take off the dead stuff so that the stuff that's still alive grows better. Like There's all of these things that go into making sure that your plants grow, and basically, if your plants aren't growing, then they're dying. And it got me thinking about my faith and my trust in Jesus and how it's similar. Like if my faith is not growing, then it's dying. And we need to be watering and weeding and taking off the things that we're supposed to be dead to in order to continue on growing. Because the freedom in Jesus doesn't just free us to do whatever we want, it frees us from our sins so that we can more closely resemble him and we have to take off the dead stuff and we have to water the right things, we have to fertilize and we have to do all of these things because he didn't come to the earth for himself and he also didn't die for himself. We see in his actions and his words that a lot of it was centered around care and protection and a love of others. And as you take communion today, I ask that you reflect on those things. What are the things that you need to be growing? What are the dead things that you need to be removing? And what do you need to continue on learning and unlearning in order to walk a little bit more like Jesus?
you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Thank you, Lord. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down. Hello, Northeast. It is so good to be with you today and to be opening God's Word together. And I'm excited to talk about this passage because it covers a topic I'm really excited about, which is children. And I love talking about children, but I also just love digging into God's Word and exploring it together. And I can't wait to unpack what God wants to teach us today. So before we get started, if you could join me in a prayer of release. And kids out there, I know you already know what this is, so you can tell your parents how to participate. But we're just going to take an open hands posture as we pray so that we can release the things that might distract us and better receive the things that God wants to teach us today. Would you join me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and trust that it is living and active. And so today, as we open your word together, we release the things that might distract us, whether they're in the room or outside of the room, we release those things to you so that we can receive what you want to teach us, how you want to speak to us from your word today. Amen. All right, kids in the room, I'm going to have a special assignment for you in just a minute. But first, since we're talking about kids and their place within God's kingdom, I wanted to start with a story of myself as a kid and a way that I became a part of God's kingdom or God's family. So I'm going to tell this story and kids in the room, I hope that you get a kick out of hearing a story about four-year-old me. Um, but that's how old I was at the beginning of this story. I was four and I'm one of those weird people who has a lot of really clear memories memories from being really little. So this is one of my earlier memories and I was four and my dad was going to be playing Jesus in our church's cantata. And for those of you who did not grow up in the church in the 80s, uh, you might not know what a cantata is, but a cantata is a, a musical actually. It's a Christian musical that tells, I think, part of a Bible story. And so we were in, um, we were going to this Easter cantata. My dad was playing Jesus. And so before um, we went, my parents sat me down and they had a little talk with me and probably my brothers too. And we're like, hey, just so you know, like you know the story of Jesus. You know that people heard him and said mean things and that he died. And we want to make sure you understand that your dad is playing Jesus, but it's not real. The story is real, but your dad being Jesus isn't real. So nobody's really heard him and your dad's of course not gonna die so we just don't want you to be scared so I was really grateful they prepared me for that so I was like okay dad getting hurt not real Jesus dying real okay got it 
So I remember going and uh, watching this cantata and I remember my actual, one of the memories I have from that is actually the part that we're gonna hear about today, which was the part where Jesus welcomed the little children. So my dad is like welcoming these little kids and they're sitting on his lap. I remember being kind of mad, like, hey, that's my dad. Why are other little girls sitting on his lap? And I was a little bit jealous. Uh, but then the other part was the crucifixion scene. And I remember that really clearly. Like I can remember sitting in the balcony and seeing, you know, the cross on the stage and watching my dad like hang on the cross and telling myself like, okay, this isn't real. Like my dad is okay, but Jesus really did die and sort of weighing that heaviness of sadness. I remember feeling so sad and knowing that while um, my dad was okay, like also knowing that Jesus suffered and Jesus died. And as I grappled with my own sadness, it sort of hit me that God must have been so sad. It wasn't pretending. God watched Jesus and God must have been so sad. And how much must God love us? How much must God love me that he was willing to send his son to die for me? And I don't remember what happened afterwards. I remember being home and, and getting into bed and still thinking about it and still feeling sad about it and still feeling um, sad for myself, but also like recognizing God's sadness and wrestling with that a little bit and, and with the fact that God loved me. And I had this like really strong prompting uh, from the Holy Spirit that I was supposed to get out of my bed and pray. And I was supposed to, to, to ask Jesus to be my savior, to accept him as my savior and, and ask forgiveness for my sins. And so I'm sitting in bed and I'm, I'm like having this dilemma, right? Because my parents told me to stay in bed, but I was like, God, I think wants me to get out of bed. And so do I obey my parents or do I obey God? And I think I eventually sort of like realized, okay, God's the boss of my parents. This is going to be cool. I'll tell them tomorrow. We'll be fine. And so I did. I got out of my bed and I kneeled next to my bed and I prayed and I asked God to forgive me. And I thanked him for how much he loved me. And I asked Jesus to be my savior. And that was sort of my first memory of really what it meant to understand and to receive God's love for me. And so I've been thinking a lot about this that this week as I've been looking at uh, the way God calls us to be as children in receiving the kingdom. So kids in the room, without further ado, or for those of you who, like me, sometimes like to have something to do while you're listening, here is what your assignment is for today. You can grab art supplies, or you can grab Legos, or you can grab Play-Doh, whatever it is that you like to create with, and here's what I want you to make. I want you to make a picture or a sculpture of yourself in God's kingdom. What does it look like for you to have a place in God's kingdom? And if that's a little too confusing or abstract, you could also do a picture of you with Jesus. What would that look like if you, especially as a child, were with Jesus? So kids, you can get started on that as we get ready to read from God's word today. So if you have your Bible, you can go ahead and grab it and turn with me. We're going to be reading in Mark chapter 10. Hopefully you were reading with us this week. You've been reading along. Um, our whole church is reading through the book of Mark, even our kids. So that's been exciting. Uh, so Mark 10, big 10, verse 13, little 13. Here's what it says. People were bringing little children to Jesus to have him touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth. Anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, put his hands on them and blessed them. So when we teach part of God's story to kids, we always ask them this question and kids, you can answer this right where you're at. Who is the main character in the story? Who's the main character in God's story? That's right, it's God or it's Jesus. In this story, the main character, of course, is Jesus, but in every part of God's story, God is the main character. So it's important for us to take a close look at what Jesus is doing in this passage. And I think there's three things that Jesus does in this passage that we're gonna take a closer look at. The first of these things is that he rebukes his disciples. He gets indignant, right? The second thing is that he instructs them to receive the kingdom as a child. And the third thing is that he welcomes the children. Those are the things that I think we see Jesus doing in this passage, and we're going to unpack those, especially the second one, a little bit more together. 
So part of Jesus' mission was to challenge commonly held beliefs. We see him doing this with the Pharisees, and now we see him doing this with his own disciples as well. We are not called to be gatekeepers in God's kingdom. And I think that's what Jesus is telling his disciples. You don't get to decide who's in and who's out. That's not your job. Jesus says indignantly, I love that word, don't hinder them, the children, the kingdom belongs to them. In fact, if you don't receive the kingdom as a child, you'll never enter it. Those are some strong words. Jesus is calling his disciples to receive the kingdom as a child. And then he goes to name three steps in which you too can receive the kingdom as a child. Okay, of course, he doesn't do that. It would be nice if he did. So we have to sort of draw from the text to try and understand what did Jesus mean when he said receive the kingdom as a child. And if you look at the children in this passage, they're really passive. We don't really see them doing anything. They're dependent on their parents to bring them. They're dependent on the disciples who try to keep them away. They're dependent on Jesus who ultimately welcomes them, but they're not really doing anything. Sometimes we talk about this passage and we talk about childlike faith and childlike faith is amazing. And I have learned great things from children and their faith. Don't get me wrong, but we don't really see children exhibiting faith in this passage. What we do see um, is Jesus addressing people in his context and in his time and how they treated children. And so this really, this passage is not necessarily about children's faith or anything they've done. In Jesus' time, there wasn't a modern or a parallel for sort of our modern <clears throat> fascination with child development. Childlike faith wouldn't have been a thing that they really talked about in the way that we do now. They just didn't value children in that way. Like think about it, there wasn't a Disney World back then that was built just for the entertainment and enjoyment of children. They didn't have schools that would educate and feed and enrich children while their parents went to work. In fact, children had no value until their father named them as heirs. It was a, a common at times practice in secular societies to discard or to limit the number of children in their households. Um, if they weren't wanted, if the children weren't wanted, or if being an heir wasn't valuable to their family, they could just discard them. And this was something that the Jews stood against. We see this all the way back in the days of Moses, right? And all the way through to the time of Jesus, Jewish uh, families would have stood against that practice. But Jesus is calling them to go one step further. He's saying not to simply allow children to live, but to welcome them to the table in his kingdom. You could say that Jesus wasn't just pro-birth, he was pro-life. Imagine the modern parallel. And here Jesus names the children as heirs. He esteems them as heirs. And in fact, he tells those in his proximity to posture themselves as fellow heirs becoming like children to enter the kingdom. Now here I wanna pause and sort of juxtaposition this story against the one that comes next to it, which is a story growing up I call the story of the rich young ruler, right? We're probably familiar with the story, hopefully you read it this week, but a man comes to Jesus and he's wealthy and he says, God, or Jesus, what should I do to inherit the kingdom? And Jesus talks about the commands of, of the commandments and, and the man's like, oh, we're good there. I followed those, I know those, I followed the rules, so we're good. And Jesus says, there's one thing you lack. Give everything you have to the poor and come and follow me. And at this point, this man is really sad and he walks away. This was too much. The bar was too high. And Jesus makes a point. He turns to his disciples and he says, how hard is it for the wealthy to inherit the kingdom? Which is interesting because in the passage prior, he talks about how it's something that children can do. How hard is it to enter the kingdom? So hard that you have to be like a child? How does that even make sense? Well, I think if you compare the rich man and the little children, you'll see some of these truths. The rich man, it says, lacked nothing. He had money, he had privilege, he had power. Little children, on the other hand, especially in that culture, had nothing. They were completely dependent on their parents, namely their father. The rich man also lacked trust. And what we know about little children is that they are uniquely positioned, both practically and developmentally, to trust. Now, the interesting about children developmentally and how they develop trust is that, um, you know, we learn that as babies, 
right? Our babies cry and we meet their need and they cry and we meet their need and they develop trust in this way. They are actually dependent on their caregivers to even be able to develop trust. That's how dependent little children are. So how do we become like little children? How do we um, move from this posture of the rich man who had everything and somehow lacked to a posture of children? Well, we'll get back to that. And I think honestly, it's something the Holy Spirit has to help you answer. But I just wanna finish by paying attention to the third thing that Jesus did. And that was welcome the children. This isn't the main part of the story, but when Jesus does something, we need to pay attention. The things he does are the things that he values. And so because of what we see Jesus doing, we know that we are called to welcome children in Jesus name. As parents, we can do this in our own homes, right? We have access to children almost 24 seven. And so we get the opportunity to welcome children in Jesus name. And we're called to do this in the ways that we open God's word and share what God is teaching us when we rise and when we sit down and when we come and when we go, this is our greatest calling to welcome our kids to Jesus and learn how we can do the same. Now, some of us are not parents, and so we don't have children in our homes, but you can still welcome children and learn from them, whether it's joining a life group with families who do have children and including children at times, so you can welcome and also learn from them. Or maybe it's volunteering with our Northeast kids or our students, so again, you can welcome them in Jesus' name and learn how you can take their posture and receive the kingdom. Before I close with the final question for you to reflect on, I wanna tell you one more story. And this is not a story about me, but it is a story about three other little girls. Um, Amari and Serenity and Audrey were three of about a dozen kids who came through our home as we were a volunteer safe family and then a foster family. And part of our calling or mission in, in serving with this ministry was um, of course to provide food and shelter but also to share the gospel. That was a really important part of what we were called to. And I remember um, trying to read the Bible and teach stories to some of these little girls in the beginning and realizing the way I'd been taught to teach children was not working with them. You see, a really common thing um, when we teach kids about God is to say things like, um, how do you know God loves you? Well, what are some things God's given you? A house, food, clothes? Those are ways that God shows that he loves you. Well, what about if you're homeless? What about if you don't have food? Does God not love you? Another common question would be like, a way God, or a way God shows his love for you is by giving you a family. That's a way that God cares for and loves you. Well, what if you're separated from your family? What if your family is neglectful or abusive? Does that mean that God doesn't love you? How do you point kids whose lives are not good to a God that is good? That was my question. And I reached out to a friend of mine who'd been a foster parent for years. And I asked her that question, like, how do I teach them about a good God when they've seen so much that isn't good? And here's what she said to me. She said, teach them the story of Joseph because Joseph knows what it's like to be mistreated and rejected and abandoned. Joseph knows what it's like to live in a life of injustice, but God was always with them. Teach them the story of Moses. Moses knows what it's like to be separated from your family, to be raised by someone who's not your mother. Teach them about Miriam and the ways that she took care of her baby brother and even as a little girl worked to keep her family together. Teach them about Moses and Miriam because God was always with them, always working for their good. And teach them about Jesus because Jesus certainly knew what it was like to suffer and be rejected. And he chose that life just because he loves you. Teach them about how Jesus suffered because he loves you. And you guys, I can't even describe the hope and the joy and the hunger on their faces when I would tell them these stories and when they would encounter the truth of God's love and his word, they responded in ways I never have, in ways my own children didn't. I learned so much about what it's like to receive the kingdom and loving kids from hard places. We have so much to learn about how to receive God's kingdom 
from children and especially children from hard places. So how do we become more like them? That's the question, right? And that's the reflection I'm gonna leave you with. We're gonna put the question up on the screen, but I'm gonna read it to you too. The question is, what do you need to give up or let go of a release in order to receive the kingdom like a child? Think about it, pray about it, let the Holy Spirit help you answer, and then share your answers with the people in your house or in the chat. Hey, Northeast. Uh, there's been a lot of conversations in our culture around race and reconciliation, and I want you to know that those conversations have been happening here at Northeast as well. Many of us in leadership were recognizing that we had issues, that we personally had issues, and it led to further conversations among leaders, elders, and staff. And it led us to the point where we recognized we, made, we needed to make a statement about where we were and the journey we were on. So we labored over the words and the statement, but you should be receiving in your mail either already or in the next few days, a statement from us as elders and staff. And it simply reflects where we are right now. And so Roger Fritz, chairman of our elders here to, to share with you, uh, we wanna to share together kind of where our heart is in, in making the statement. Hey, I wanna let you guys know that we've been uh, working on this for weeks. Uh, we have had a lot of dialogue amongst ourselves. Uh, we have looked into the scriptures. Uh, we've listened to God's word. We've prayed and we've listened to the spirit. Uh, it's a journey that we're on. Uh, so even the statement is not perfect as it's written. I want you to know that. Uh, so I would like you to approach this whole topic of racism the same way we are. We are in a learning mode, we are studying, we are looking into scriptures, and we're praying and we're listening to the Spirit continually. And I invite you to do that. We would, we would be overjoyed if the whole body of Northeast would join us on this journey. Thanks. Yeah, we've, we've been in different places, and we still are in different places amongst eldership and staff. And, but one of the things that we've been committed to is unity and to be gracious with one another. So as you receive this letter, we understand that some of you might receive it and not agree with every word or every statement, but just be gracious and understand that this is where we are after several weeks. And we are still on this journey. So I would ask you to pray for us. I pray that you would uh, pray for the staff and the elders. Our heart here is to see and hear what we need to see and hear. 
And I also want to encourage you to learn and grow with us. Just grow in your understanding. And recognize that when complex issues happen in our culture, our first reactions aren't necessarily the right ones. I know my first reactions to the things that were happening were not the right ones. But with time and understanding and listening and growing and maturing, I'm, I'm seeing things differently, but I'm still not where I need to be. So I just want to encourage you to pray for us, be gracious with us, and, um, and join us. It is our endeavor to, to honor God in the way we um, respond as a church. Our mission and our drive is to help each other to become right with God in every way. And so that is what we intend to do. We want to encourage you to pursue a right relationship with God and your place in his story. God bless you guys. Love you. You know, as we take some time to think and reflect on all that we've heard today, let's just take some time to respond in worship, to realize that, that we are all in this together, that God wired us up as, as people to love and to care for those that are hurting, to raise and build others up. So this last song that we're going to sing, it's called All the People Said Amen. Let's join together. Let's proclaim this together. people said amen. You heard from a lot of people in today's message. We saw a lot of faces um, and I pray that as we close out this message that you also take the time to sit and reflect um, how God's Spirit is speaking to you right now throughout this message, um, how those things are sitting with you and, and you talk and pray with God about how, where this message has found you and where it's going to take you um, throughout this week. So let me pray for that. If you can close your eyes, I always tell the kids, hold your hands in whatever posture you would like. Dear Heavenly Father, may it be so. May the things that we have learned um, through your word and through your teachers today stick with us um, and change us as we continue to grow and we seek after what it means to be 
in a relationship with you. And I pray um, specifically for the children and the students watching um, this message today and hearing from your word just how deeply um, the gospel is for them. There is no junior Holy Spirit, but the same God, the same spirit is speaking to all of us right now. And so I pray that we listen. In Jesus' name, amen. There's still the chat up on the side if you're watching in the watch party right now. So you can put a prayer request in there if you have any prayer needs or just continue chatting for the next couple minutes. And we're here for you guys. Let us know what you need. Have a good week.